it doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for, and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you'll risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you've touched the center of your own sorrow, if you've been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it, fade it, or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, be realistic, remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you're telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself, if you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul, if you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. There was something so pleasant about that face. Even your emotions had an echo in so much space. And when you're out there without care, yeah, I was out of touch. But it wasn't because I didn't know. I just knew too much That makes me crazy That makes me crazy That makes me crazy Probably And I hope that you will have Come on now, who do you, who do you, who do you, who do you think you are? Oh, bless your soul. You really think you're in control? I was little, ever since I was little, it looked like fun, and it's 
been doing a series over the last few weeks on uh, catching fire. Um, we're, we're heading into the season of Pentecost and the idea of what, what is it that you find that catches fire in your life seems to be an important question. In fact, the image that was on that last slide of the hair on fire, you know, I, I, I actually googled, what does that mean, hair on fire? And, uh, and I get a sense that maybe a part of what's in the gospel about how Jesus wanted the disciples to live and follow um, had to do with something about that, getting your hair on fire. But we're going to talk some about that today. But as we start, let's stand and we'll say a prayer together. Holy One, as we welcome each other into this space and into this circle of friends, we also welcome within each person that amazing wondrous being they were created to be, each person around us. We welcome that within ourselves. We recognize in each particle of this creation there's that spark of glory. How can we not give thanks? Amen. Sunshine is carrying. There's a reason why I'm feeling so high. It must be the season when those love lights shine all around us. So let that feeling grab me deep inside. Send you reeling where your love can hide. Then we're stealing moonlight night with your love.
Great job singing, thank you all. Y'all take a moment and greet one another with signs of peace. You can play the part, you can act out that part, but you know it wasn't written for you. But tell me, how can you stand there with your broken heart, ashamed of playing the fool? Well, one thing can lead to another, it doesn't take any sacrifice. You know, mother and father, sister and brother, if it feels right, well, you don't think twice. Just shower the people you love with love. Show them the way that you feel. Things are gonna be just fine if you only will. What I'd like to say to you is shower the Show them the way that you feel Things are gonna be much better If you only will You can run but you cannot hide This is widely known So what you gonna do with your foolish pride When you're all by yourself all alone once you tell somebody the way that you feel, you can feel it beginning to ease. I think it's true what they say about the squeaky wheels. It's always getting the grease. So it's better to shower the people you love with love. Show them the way that you feel. Things are gonna be just fine if you only will. What I've got to say to you, shower the people you love with love. Show them the way that you feel. Things are gonna be much better if you only will. Oh, shower the people you love with love. 
they say a little rain Gotta fall on everyone Just gotta learn to let go It's not too hard now Let it rain Let the love come shine gonna be much better if you only will today is Luke chapter 12 verses 49 through 53. I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law.
just invite you to close your eyes for a few minutes now and let this idea of forgiveness maybe float through your own heart and mind. Sometimes the hardest things to forgive are the things that we are experiencing in our own hearts. Or the things that we have carried for so, so long. taking a few deep breaths to become first just aware of anything that's preventing us from feeling joy. Just to notice anything that's preventing us from feeling gratitude. a way to just become conscious a little bit of what might need to find its way to forgiveness. It's amazing how just a few minutes in a life can make such a difference. Just to pause and take a few deep breaths and notice how we often are just living out little patterns repeatedly over and over just replaying the same need or the same intention as if searching for something that we never quite seem to find. be like this morning to let go of those images and let this moment be enough for gratitude and joy and wonder. And what would it be like to let go of patterns that have haunted us? held us in their grip for so long. Holy One, we breathe in this wholeness of life that surrounds us every moment of every day. And we breathe out the limitations that we've accepted without question. Holy One, we breathe in the freedom that we find in forgiving and forgiveness. And we breathe out all the cynicism and the jaded way in which we have hidden ourselves away. So we give thanks for love that beyond our ability to conceive heals and frees us
Is this moment that we arrive You don't know when it's moving And your life leaves you behind If you can't see what it's doing Trust the weight more than your mind When the wave is all around me I've got no other plans I just balance through the changes Let the wave say who I am Let the wave And miles of water From the wind beyond the lee Every wave rolls out its power As it rises on the reef A high blue wall can break you You can never fight the sea You just learn to let it take you to the place you want to be The rain is all around me I got no other plans Keep my balance through the changes Let the waves say goodbye song by David Wilcox, the chorus says, uh, when the wave is all around me, I've got no other plans. I just balance through the changes and let the wave say who I am. You know, we are surrounded by images around us of people who are full of passion, aren't we? Uh, there are people uh, who we see on television, uh, on um, talk shows uh, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, who are passionate about stuff. Sometimes they're passionate about what they're having for dinner. Sometimes they're passionate about politics. Sometimes they're, no one in here gets passionate about politics. The, the whole idea of being passionate seems to have emerged even recently as a more of a mass phenomenon perhaps than it was 50, 60, 70 years ago when people, uh, I think, were a little bit more staid. They were a little more calm about their expressions about things. There was a certain, at least where I grew up in Mississippi, a certain gentility. You didn't really talk about too much. That whole religion, politics, I don't remember what the other one was. But don't talk about it. That's not there anymore. Now we talk about it, but we talk about it, and we talk about it passionately. We talk about our positions, only, but we only do it with people who agree with us. Because we know what happens, other ones. It divides us. A good friend, even a family member, even your mother, if you start talking politics and get passionate about it, and she's on the other side of that, you can find yourself orphaned. <laughs> It's intense sometimes, this passion thing. So what is it that Jesus is talking about when he starts talking about, I have come to bring fire to the earth, and I wish it was burning already. And this fire is going to divide people in families. What? This is not the kumbaya fire we used to stand around and sing. 
This is a different kind of fire. What kind of fire is this that Jesus says he's bringing to the earth? Do we really want more of this stuff? Because it seems like our world's got enough of that already. You know, sometimes I wonder if Congress would start talking to each other a little bit better if we learned to talk to each other better. So many of us, even within our own families, are divided over so many issues that we find ourselves having the same conversations every time the conflict emerges. And so we just stop talking. We retreat to the places where we can pull the wagons in a circle with people that we have in common and we talk. But it's interesting to me that if you really kind of, uh, you know, begin to look into the gospel, you find that Jesus wasn't about kind of just kind of pulling together a few people. He was out there inviting people to a way that was going to be, in many cases, divisive. It was going to call the culture into question. It was going to call people's lives into question. And how would you deal with that conflict if you are Jesus? If you felt a sense of calling and passion and purpose and you saw in your life a sense of truth that you needed to speak that sometimes was going to be at odds both with the people that you loved and with the people, the culture that you lived in, how would you go about that and manage it? This is an incredibly important problem in our world today. And when it comes to the idea of us catching fire with this sense of what Jesus had to invite us to, perhaps it is key. Because I think just like many of us in our conversations politically, many of us have withdrawn from having any dialogue and we appear to be among the apathetic masses. There is a sense in which those of us who are people of faith sometimes fall into the same Situation. We've seen enough people be so committed that they've alienated our friends and us. So passionate about their faith that they seem a little crazy. And so for us, we hold back. And as a result, the dominant conversation within the culture around issues of faith and spirituality are often people who have dynamic ways of creating spiritual hell for people. They have dynamic ways of talking about faith that put people under so much judgment and shame and manipulation that we want to reject and step back from all of them. Because it's not the Jesus that we know, but what's the other voice? Where are the other voices offering alternatives in our culture today? We need to catch fire. But how do you catch fire in a different way? I have a friend named Gary David who is a psychologist. He's out in L.A. I, I, I get a little mentoring from him from time to time because he, uh, well, let's just say he's read a lot of books I haven't. I've read these books. He read those books. And when I was studying, those books just were too hard. And so I decided I would call up Gary one day and I said, Gary, can you just mentor me? Because every time I start into that book, I get lost and I stop reading. And he said, yeah. So we've spent some time. And interestingly enough, just recently in a conversation on a Sunday afternoon, Gary was talking to me about relationships. He said, in any relationship, you know, any real good relationship, he said, you know, it really comes down to there's three things that you have to have. He said, you have to have, you have to have these three things. He says, you, you've got to have acceptance. You, you've got to have commitment and you have to have trust. And as I was approaching listening to the passage that we read today, his thoughts came to me and I had to add to them. Because I began to think, you know, in my relationships, I do need acceptance and commitment and trust, but I also need a certain level of awareness. And I'm convinced that this is the same thing that we need if we want to have the kind of passion for life and for the loving life that Jesus invites Christians to, that we need. And 
I want to just explore these four things. Awareness, acceptance, commitment, and trust. I think if you really look in the gospel, if you, if you really read the gospels, you see a portrait of a, a person who not only lives, but invites people to a certain level of awareness about themselves and about others. Don't you? I mean, whatever you've read of the gospel, surely you've read some things like, you know, where Jesus says, if your right eye offends you, take it out. He wants to invite us to recognize it's the, what we think and feel in our hearts that affect the experience more than the external experience. Take the beam out of your eye before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. There's a certain level of just self-awareness that Jesus continues to want to invite people to. And that may seem really simple, but my experience is that that kind of transformation of my capacity to understand me and to be aware of the way in which my automatic kind of way of being sometimes gets in my way is a, is a lifetime journey of discovery. I could spend the rest of my life just really paying attention and noticing all the ways in which I automatically say things without even thinking twice about it. Or the way I look at something without taking it in. Or the faces of people in my immediate presence, even those closest to me who I take for granted and have begun to kind of see in a way that's very automated. Self-awareness in this sense, the level of awareness that we're talking about is something that has to begin with awakening to this moment is this moment, not last moment. And so much of what we tend to perceive about every moment has already been defined. I've met you before. I know who you are. I've been in this service before. I know what they're going to do. I've listened to Charles speak before. Been there. Done that. Got the t-shirt, used it in a garage sale. So if I've been there and done that, how can anything new come in? How can I experience anything new? The past often defines the present. We, we no longer are open to this moment being something new and different that I might experience something of the spirit of this life, this moment, coming through in a way that awakens me in a new way. And self-awareness also involves becoming very clear about how my intention in this moment is defining everything I am thinking about. For instance, if you're already thinking about how we're going to beat the Baptists to the brunch, then this moment has become an impediment to your getting to brunch. And everything I say is basically going to be redefined as wish he would hurry up. <laughs> Our goal, our intention of where we're headed is defining what we experience in this moment. If you can become a little self-aware of this, you can begin to push back against those forces in your life and begin to recognize, what is my goal right now? That's a level of awareness that can change your life. It can change your relationships. The second piece is acceptance. And I believe Gary is right when he tells me that in every relationship, one of the most important keys is to recognize that your goals and your history that are defining your experience of this moment are very different from mine. Your history of how to make meaning out of anything is different from mine. And if I can't come to a place of being able to accept that, then I don't have a way to relate to you. I simply, I simply want to convert you to my way. And relating to you is about honoring and respecting. And respecting is about re-inspecting, seeing you in the way that I can see you if I stop and really listen and pay attention, not for what I thought you were supposed to be, that's my image and goal, or my history defining the moment, but for who you seem to be right now. How can I experience you that way? Relationships are about taking it into that moment. And I will tell you, you know, I work with lots and lots of people and lots and lots of relationships, and it's awful hard if you've been in a relationship with someone for more than six weeks to not have a long enough history that it's pretty hard to say, I'm going to look at you new today. And when you 
squeezed the toothpaste from the wrong end. I'm going to pretend that never happened before. And I'm going to just take this moment in and not get screaming mad because it's the 15th time in the last two months. But it's the past that amplifies these moments into something so much bigger than they actually are. It's that we lay these things over on top of them. And so learning to recognize that it's my memory and my images and my future that want me to make you like me, somehow acceptance of what's your experience in this moment? Wow, if I could get Republicans and Democrats to do that. Or a few independents, maybe some libertarians, to all come together and just say, okay, whatever we've had happen in the past, whatever you know, your candidate said about my candidate, what all that stuff, let's just talk about what's happening now. And let's have a conversation about where did you get your perspectives? And where did I get mine? And let's talk about what's good about both of those. Dialogue, what a concept. The third piece is that beyond having some awareness and, and the ca capacity for acceptance, we need commitment. Now, commitment has a bad rap in our culture, not just relationally, because so many relationships don't seem to last, but commitment has a bad rap in terms of having any sense of real passion about any particular idea because ideas change so rapidly in our culture that what was true two weeks ago about the internet ain't true today. What happens in our lives that changes so rapidly is information. We get committed to certain pieces of information, but that changes constantly, constantly. And you know what we do too? I may commit to you, but when I commit to you, you're this. Six weeks from now, you may be something else. There's dynamics within each one of us that continue to change. So commitment is not maybe best done as a commitment to something that is static. Consider the possibility that like the piece Megan read for us at the opening of the service, the invitation by Orion Mountain Dreamer, the idea of commitment might be something a little deeper than just committing to that you are always going to look like that or always think like that. The commitment might have to do with committing to honest honest integrity and dialogue between us. In fact, I would suggest that the images of commitment that are not working in our culture today, where we see people so committed to things that don't work, are possibly because those people and those images that we see seem really high on commitment, but not very high on the first two that we talked about. Not very high on awareness. Not very high on acceptance. I would challenge us to recognize that that image of commitment that has no real sense of awareness or acceptance, no self-awareness or very low self-awareness and very little sense of real acceptance of those differences is not in the gospel. That is not the image of commitment I see for the disciples or for Jesus whose hair was on fire. If you want our, our hair to be on fire, we want to follow the gospel, I would suggest that we have to have commitment that includes the sense of acceptance and awareness. This is work we have to do within us. And finally, to live with a sense of commitment to that sense of wholeness in life that simply by living in this level of awareness and acceptance, we breathe and live is to somehow embody something of the divine in the world around us. We become the Christ in the lives of other people. There's a wonderful prayer called by St. Teresa that says, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the hands through which he wants to do good. You want to live out that compassion in your life? Try this Get committed to it. But get committed to it with a sense of acceptance for all. With a sense of awareness of your own life and your own tendencies. 
Try living that out. Try living that out in your relationships. You'll find that it's a fire that divides. But it divides in a way that is loving, accepting. It calls people into question, yes. To live that kind of accepting life calls people and cultures into question. And it sometimes will get you (coughs) pushed away. And in those moments, we need trust. We need trust in the way, the truth, and the life being a path that is for us to follow. I mean, we need trust that somehow in the midst of uh, even what looks like an overwhelming wave of a world that doesn't seem to get it, that somehow living out this fragile, vulnerable truth can make a difference. Like the song says, when the wave is all around me and I've got no other plans, I just balance through the changes and let the waves say who I am. To be present in this moment, to be present right now with all of my love, with all of my capacity for awareness, to accept that in others. What else could God ask for? of us than to live that out in each other's lives. Amen. So let's all stand and sing together our Garfunkel song. As we're singing, if you have an offering, bring it forward at this time while we're singing. And if you'd like to join the church, this community, 1111 Celebration, I invite you to come forward as well as we're singing. Celebrating his mother's 90th. Uh, this Any other birthdays this uh, this time around? Anything? Uh, a birthday? Harley. They got remarried. Yeah, Vivian Bloom and her husband remarried last night. That's always fun, you know. Full circle. Yeah. Okay, what you got? My cat really. All right, so we'll celebrate Lily the cat. All right, that's awesome. 
So uh, there's some announcements in the back of your bulletin. I'll just invite you to see those, particularly the Roots of Change Intensive coming up here in a few weeks. If you haven't had a chance to do that, we invite you to come join us for that. Let's say a prayer together as we go. And I remind you that if there's something in particular you would like to uh, have someone just share in prayer with you over, we have some uh, prayer partners that will gather back in the corner back there by the sound um, after the service, and uh, they, they'll be there to, to pray with you if you'd like. Holy One, as we leave this place, we go with a sense that there is a new challenge for us to learn how to live with this commitment, this passion, to commit ourselves to a way that has truth in life. We see the example. Awaken our hearts to see in our own lives the way in which we have been unaware to open our hearts in ways that have acceptance for those around us both for their awareness and their lack open our hearts also to live in the commitment and to trust the journey we don't have to be at the end of it we don't have to know it all we don't have to have all the answers you invite us to just take the next step. Bless us as we go from this place, we pray. Amen. Who do you, who do you, who do you think you